In Buddhism, liberation is achieved through awareness. Being aware of the world around us is important. A verse from Verses for Environmental Practice by Zen teacher Robert Atkin, called Dharma Rain, Sources of the Buddhist Environmentalism, is as follows. Watching a spider at work, I vow with all beings to cherish the web of the universe. Touch one point and everything moves. This shows the importance of having spiritual and ecological awareness and also interconnection between all things in the Buddhist practice. This verse wants you to be aware of all ecological processes in everyday activity. Everything in the universe depends on everything else. In the Buddhist practice, everything has a purpose in life and nothing should be overlooked. We as humans need to learn that we depend on the environment and the environment depends on us. You could look at the world as a chain reaction. If you mess with one thing, you end up messing with many other things in the world. The Buddhist wants you to be involved in environmental activism. I visualize myself as being one leaf on the tree of life, and I realize that the sap of the tree runs through every leaf, including me, says John Seed, meaning everything matters, big or small. We are only a fraction on this earth, but we still matter. Activists are basing their work on Buddhism due to the environmental crisis. Buddhism looks at the importance of preserving the earth and being non-harming to the environment. Even though Buddha walked the earth 2,500 years ago, Buddhism is still very important today. Buddhism is what promotes the brotherhood of all beings. In The Power of Myth, Joseph Campbell suggests when humans destroy their environment, nature and the revelations of nature, they destroy their own nature, themselves, and the song, says Janet Berber Rich. When we destroy the environment, we are destroying a part of ourselves also. We need our environment because everything relies on one another. What would we do without trees? Trees provide us with oxygen. Without oxygen, we would not be able to breathe. Campbell also says, mythology is the song of the imagination, inspired by energies of the body and that Buddhism comes close as being the mythology of the planet. Buddhism sees all beings as Buddha beings. This means nothing and no one is left out. Even if you do not want to be involved with Buddhism, they still see you as part of their religion. You are accepted in the religion no matter who you are. Also in Buddhism it teaches the task is only to know what is and then to act in relation to the brotherhood of all these beings. We need to live with nature and not try and take control over it and go with the flow of it. We need to see ourselves equally with all living things. Campbell also says, to live in harmony with nature is central to Buddhist practice. In Buddhism everything is equally important no matter how big or how small. Buddha stresses the importance of nature in the Buddhism religion. Practice is needed to see ourselves and nature as one, says Alan Battinger in Dharma Gaya, a harvest of essays in Buddhism and ecology. This takes time to become one with nature. With good practice and commitment, it can be learned. In Buddha's life, important events were centered near natural settings. These settings were usually centered around a tree. Chatsumar and Kabil Singh wrote in Early Buddhist Views of Nature. He said, Buddha was born in a grove of sal, lovely straight-backed trees with large leaves. During his youth, he would meditate in the shade of a jumbo tree, which is one of 650 myrtle specimens. He did further studying near a banyan tree. During Buddha's enlightenment, he was under the ficus religiosa, also known as the bow, bodhi, or the people. This tree is very sacred in Buddhism, due to this is where he attained enlightenment. It is known that the early Buddhist community did its living in a forest. One legend that is told of a monk who cut down a branch from a tree. The spirit of the tree then complained to Buddha telling him that he has cut off one of his child's arms. This led to Buddha making the decision that no one should be able to cut down trees or any part of them. The Buddha wanted the people to have compassion about the trees. He reproached travelers who had cut down a bayan after it had, like a friend, proved them shade, leading to the importance of preserving the environment, which is a key concept in Buddhism. It is known that Chinese master Lin Ji planted many pine and cedar trees at the monastery. 
He planted trees because they live way beyond his life and provide beauty, stability, and shade. This is a way for him to give generations long after his passing to provide shade and beauty. He also advocated for the other people to also plant trees. It enables you to give something that helps people long after you have died. The Blessed One is one who sits under the Bodhi tree, which is the tree of enlightenment. This tree is known as the tree of immortal knowledge, where he received an illumination that has enlightened all of Asia for 2,500 years. This tree symbolizes the great awakening. It is the great wisdom tree, the essence of Buddha. Its roots strike down deep in stability, whose flowers are moral acts, which bears righteousness as its fruits. They will sit cross-legged for seven days at the foot of the tree. This is usually along the banks of the Naranyana River, facing towards the east direction of the rising sun. As they sit, they are absorbing bliss of illumination. The Blessed One would be faced with three temptations. These temptations were lust, fear, and submission to public opinion. He would not give in to these temptations because he was deep in meditation. After achieving enlightenment, he moves a short way to the Bayan tree, also known as the tree of Gothar. Buddha sits under the tree for another seven days, cross-legged. Under this tree, the Buddha absorbs in the bliss of his illumination once again. The Buddha then moves to a third great tree, which is known as the tree of the serpent king, Muchalinda. Under this tree, the Buddha sits cross-legged for seven days. The cobra is able to protect the Blessed One from the clouds, meaning he was able to keep him safe from the rain and other weather. At the end of seven days, it uncoils itself and forms itself into a young boy. The image of the Muchalinda Buddha represents the harmonious union of the dualities of thought and the reconciliation of antagonistic principles with the coming together of the serpent that symbolizes the life force that motivates birth and rebirth as well as the savior, conqueror of that, blind will for life, severer of the bonds of birth, pointer of the path to the imperishable transcendent. There is the archetypal story of Prince Siddhartha. He sat under the Bodhi tree, swearing not to move until he could solve the problem of suffering. Some accounts say that he sits under the tree for seven days. Then there are other accounts that he sits under the tree for seven weeks. In the Zen tradition, it is said to be a seven-day intensive sitting. The Bodhi tree is highly symbolic in Buddhism. J.C. Cooper says, the bow tree represents perfection, contemplation, and mediation. This symbol is of the great awakening of the Buddha. Penguin Dictionary of Symbols by Jean Chevalier and Elaine Gerbrandt say that in the early Buddhist iconology, the Bodhi tree actually stands for the Buddha himself. This tree also represents the world tree. The world tree being the upward path along which proceed those who pass from the visible to the invisible. The Bodhi tree is also known to represent life. Siddhartha claimed that he had been awakened. People were skeptical, so his awakening was challenged. His reaction was calmly touching the ground before him, calling the earth itself as his witness. This can be memorized in many images known as the Sakamuni Buddha. He sits cross-legged with his fingertips touching the ground. The earth goddess then emerges to verify Sakamuni's awakening. This reveals Buddhism as a quality earth religion. The Bodhisattva practice holds everything we need for awakening is present in the very ground upon which we sit. There is no need to search beyond our surroundings. When Siddhartha awakened, it is said the entire earth and all its creatures awakened together. A good poem showing all we need is right in front of us by Hakun, who is an 18th century Zen master. Not knowing how near the truth is, people seek it far away.